Alex. Hey, how we doing? Doing good. Hey, I got a question for you. How come sometimes you're on the right and sometimes I'm on the left and sometimes I'm on the right, you're on the left? What are you talking about? Oh, Mr. Magic. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I was wondering. Do you like your right side or your left side? I like side to be better? on the right. Yeah, I'm right. Like if they ever want to draw blood, draw it on the right side. I'm got right. it. Yeah, I'm just. This is, this is better. I don't even use my left are. hand, just hangs like a dead thing. It's just like, uh. so anyhow, did you, did you see that video I sent you of the guy, right? That jumped, jumped on the back of a moose. Yes. Oh, yes, my. I did. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen. If you knew how bad a moose can stomp you to death oh. so quick, they're by far the most dangerous animal in North America. So was that the coolest thing you've ever seen or the dumbest thing you've ever seen? Oh, the complete <laughs> dumbest. But after he did it, and I, what I loved is he goes like this after he's riding it for a while. He goes, it's like a rodeo rider. And then he, then he bailed off, and I'm like, dude, you are so lucky that moose did not turn around and just get you. The you know, thinking rodeo. you're a wolf or something. Oh, yeah. And leaped on his back. Oh, um, man. Anyhow. So with that, we have... Michael Freeman on tonight. Michael is the author of the new Freeman File book and the son of Paul Freeman, legend, Bigfoot legend, uh, Paul Freeman. And Paul was a researcher forever, and we're going to get into all sorts of details. So this is kind of a untold radio special, I guess. Right? Absolutely. Let's just call it special. It's special. We'll just say it's special. It is special. So, and, and Michael's really busy and he's um, tough to get on, right? Absolutely. It's tough he, to book. He's, he's tougher than booking like somebody like Duncan Trussell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're putting that out into the ether? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's kind of like, who was that that dogged? Um, oh, Matt Damon got dogged on some, I think it was the, was it not the Tonight Show? There was some show that dogged him because he didn't show up for a like for an interview or for something. A, for or a right? good while, did he eventually cave? No, this went on for years. Every day, it's like hi to Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Matt just never responded to an interview request or whatever. So that could know. be that could be our uh, Duncan can be our our yeah. guy. Yeah. So let's um, without further ado. Let's bring Michael Freeman on. Hey, Mike. Hey, hey guys. How you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Like you said, busy. Hanging yeah. in there. I'm a little under the weather, but uh, hopefully Ugh. we can have a good show. Yeah. No, it'll be good. If you um, need to blow your nose, just shut your camera off. Just go, sh just yeah. shut it off. and Like that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> but we appreciate, we appreciate you coming on. So where in the world do we begin? First, um, I don't know if, if you prepared a photo of, of the book. We can show people the book. I never even asked you to do that, did I? Uh, You're talking to me, aren't you? I'm talking to you, Alex. You're the producer. <laughs> Tell you what. You guys keep talking. I will get a photo of the book. Okay. I thought you so were talking we'll... to me for a second. No, 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 no Alex. No, oh. I'll, ne I'll never ask you for anything, Michael. It's just a bunch of questions. So, um, so this book is really unique. Let's talk about why it's unique. Um, cause it's far more than just a print book or not, or a, or a electronic book. And do you want to reveal why? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, far more than just written prose, you know, obviously, um, or just an electronic book. It's, it's a combination of, of both. And, uh, you know, it's a large hardback coffee table style book yeah. uh, should be around 200 pages or so, you know, um, and it's going to have over a hundred, well over a hundred uh, full color, full page, you know, pictures from personal photo albums and from evidence catalogs. Uh, it's going to have, you know, um, QR codes that are scannable. And those are going to feature my father's personal audio recordings that no one's ever heard. Uh, really outside of me. I mean, to be honest with you, I, there's I have a lot of them. Heard these? Uh, well, there's a, there's a lot of them. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and there's so much audio that we couldn't use it all, you know. And, and so we, we have to take clips out of it. But uh, I mean, it's well over an hour, I believe. 
Um, and then we're also going to have uh, video footage that no one's ever seen, um, as well as, you know, enhancements to footage that people have seen, like the, the Freeman footage from D-Duck Spring. Yeah, and the footage is not only enhanced, there's a pretty unique piece of footage in there that I don't think 90% of the people don't even know exists. And that's the baby lift footage. Uh, yeah, that, that is correct. There's, there's a lot of people that don't know, um, no. that that exists. Um, and I've done, uh, a small mini presentation, um, at the North American Bigfoot Center for Cliff Bergman mm -hmm. to about 50 people. None of those people wow. knew that it existed. None of them, not a single one outside Incredible. of Cliff. Um, and you know, one of his employees and of course my family, uh, nobody in that room that bought tickets there knew that that piece of, of, of footage existed. Uh, they'd never seen it before. And I had a lot of people saying, how did I miss this? Like, yeah. how, how do we not see this? You know, right. um, but I'm in the same boat because if you, but, but your me, dad, your dad never even saw it. That's what's so cool. Well, about well, it. Yeah. That's the thing is my dad never even saw it. He didn't know it was there. Um, and when he was filming the footage at about a hundred feet away through the trees at that particular moment, he never saw it happen. And if you would have asked me six or seven years ago, I would have said, no, I don't believe there was a baby in the footage because I, I was kind of on that side. Uh, but I have seen since then, you know, uh, enough enhancements of it uh, that I'm fully on board. And I think that at this point, I even asked the question, uh, if someone can tell me what else is going on in this footage, please tell me, because there's nothing else that I think could possibly be happening. Why don't you describe what's in that little clip of footage? What do you see, Michael? Because I think you're you're probably the biggest skeptic. Really, I mean, you're a skeptic on it. Uh, I was until a until you on, well, on this part of footage. Yeah, you know, I've well, let me rephrase that. that. I want to rephrase that. You didn't really had never studied it. I think you were kind of you know aware of it, and then we sent you the enhancement, and then you and your I believe you and your wife watched it. Yes. Yeah. And my wife saw it immediately, actually, uh, which is funny. Um, not zoomed in at regular speed. She saw right. it immediately, which you can see now in the new enhancement, which you couldn't see before. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's great that now you, you can watch it without it being zoomed in at 300 times without it being in slow motion. And you can actually see what is happening. And, and what you have is is a, an adult Sasquatch uh, picking up uh, what appears to be uh, a juvenile, a very small juvenile, maybe even what we would call a baby. Uh, you can see its leg and its foot dangling and it moves to wrap its legs around her waist. Mm -hmm. And it certainly appears to me that it possibly crawls onto her back. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And again, if anybody has any explanation, you know, once they, they see this and, and they get the book, you know, and we release the link to this, if you have any other explanation of what's going on, please tell me because I, I can't think of anything. Well, it was definitely the, um, you know, kind of the arrow in the bullseye when I was originally doing forensic work on it and saw that. And, and at one point I just thought, well, you know, does even Paul even know about that? Your dad even know about it? Because you're the guy that discovered it. Yeah. And he had yeah, no idea. He, so let everybody know that. Like Doug Hycheck is the guy that, yeah. that discovered this anomaly um in the film and i know you've got a, a cool little story that's going to be in the book um about yeah. how that kind of came to be yep. um yeah and then you took it to my father who had no idea no that, that this was in there um you know and you know what his reaction was to that because he yeah. was pretty excited you know he was really excited but yeah um, I, I i heard a lot of oh my gosh oh my gosh he said <laughs> right well and that's funny because I, I was talking about the presentation i did at Cliff Berrickman's Center down yeah. there in Boring, Oregon, and none of the 50 people in the audience had ever seen this before. Yeah. And we're watching the enhancements, and it's silent, and everybody's watching, and, yeah. and they're having a good time. And then this baby lift footage starts to play. And then one by one, I start hearing, oh, my God. And then people start pointing. <laughs> and it starts thing. getting louder and louder, you know, and I just kind of smiled because at that point, you're like, yeah, I mean, that's it, you know. Well, the thing is, this is not a blob. This is not a blob squatch. This is, oh. we already know for sure that's a, that's a Bigfoot. This has moving, articulating yes. limbs that you can Correct. see. I, I mean, yes. it's, it's, this is, this is a, a juvenile that's being picked up. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what's so cool is the legs go to wrap around the waist, just like you would if you picked up any infant. Yeah. So first I mean, instinct. I have a I have a 16 month old, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's what he does. You know, even today when I pick him up, he wraps his legs around me just like that and tries to hold onto my hip, you know, yeah. and that's clearly what you can see in this video. And I think it's funny that uh, the audience members, like the, the people that have seen it, a lot of the time it's the women the mothers that have children were the ones that were the most vocal that were saying, you know, and I even heard a, she's picking up a baby, you know, like that came out of the audience and, and the, the mothers realize it oh. immediately. And then they were kind of pointing it out to their husbands or whatever. And then pretty soon everybody was like looking at it and yeah. uh, it's a really cool piece of footage. And, you know, it's something that we didn't know was there. And, uh, you know, even my, my father who, who filmed it, he had, you know, looking through the, the, the viewfinder of, you know, that, that old eight millimeter camera, you know, like I said, through the trees at a hundred feet away, yeah. he never even, he never even saw it. He never saw it. No, but it was kind of in the shadows. It's just enough yeah. in the shadows where, you know, I could, there's you know, no what, way he would have seen uh, it. What's interesting. What I do want to point out that kind of coincides with that um, is that in the interview that my uh, father gave to Vance Orchard um, after his footage was taken that that was published in the Waitsburg times. He described to Vance Orchard that that individual Sasquatch that he saw at that moment, he thought to him that it looked like it had a deformality, like it had a lump on the side of its neck or its back, almost like it was kind of a hunchback uh, when he saw it. But we now know that that's not what he was looking at. He, he saw the baby. Oh my goodness. He just See? didn't realize what it was at the time. He thought it was a deformality and, and that just adds to the legitimacy of it. He didn't even know what he was looking at. Um, but- is, is that, I'm going to interrupt you. Is that in the book? That mention of that gentleman? Um, that particular episode? No, the, the, the mention of that particular episode is not, not in the book. No, I actually, um, I don't touch a whole lot myself uh on on the baby in the book and i I know you do a little bit um but uh i i kind of hint to it and then i kind of want to let the the readers who are viewing it kind of see it for themselves without going into you know highly detailed visions but it would be cool though to put the year in van van orchard saw a what he thought was a malformity on the neck of the creature now now we know what it might have been. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, I have the newspaper article. I mean, we, I can add it. <laughs> you know, I think that I think that really needs to be in the book. If we make an edit, yeah, I mean, we can do oh, that because no it, problem. it is uh, one thing that my dad did describe is is that he thought it, you know, had a deformality on it, uh, which I'm a hundred percent certain at this point is he was looking at a, a baby. Yeah, that, like, that makes total on. sense. I mean, it's it's really cool when different pieces just kind of fall into place. You know, it's just, oh, kind of nat- it's or- organic, it's natural. The other thing that the baby backs up is the fact that the actual Freeman creature that walks out into the open right. actually looks like she's postpartum. Uh, recently postpartum or pregnant again. Yeah, I'm or even pregnant again. Yeah. You know, yeah, she, ha- she has a large abdomen, you know, yeah. um, and I mean, her torso is gigantic in the first place. It's a massive, massive animal. Um, I would wager probably thicker through the chest, you know, torso, abdomen than right. what, what you're getting with Patty at least. Uh, but she certainly does look like she could be pregnant or recently postpartum. Like I, yeah. I will agree with that. Um, and you know, we, we don't really know how old no. the infant is that that's in there, you know, and, and we don't really know growth rates or anything <laughs> like that for them at this point in time, but it could be either one. It could be a toddler and she could be pregnant again. I, you know, well, I, I never even, but here's the thing, Michael, it never even occurred to me. I always just, you just assume when you look at the footage, it's a male, right? You just assume it. Well, yeah, my father, that's what I did. Yeah. When I first saw it. Yeah. So what did your, what did your dad, what, what did he presume it was? Female? Well, well male? yeah. If you've ever seen it, you hear his words. Like when it comes out, oh, there he goes. Right. So yep. oh, there he goes. Yep. <laughs> there he goes. You know, um, and and I will say also, like in, in reflection of that, that those guys, my dad and Wes and, and that group, they kind of referred to everyone they ever talked about as he. Yeah. There wasn't a whole lot oh, of yeah. she. Everyone was just he. 
he this and he that. And my dad would refer to them sometimes as a little family, but there was never one that was talked about as being a female, uh, you know, individually. Um, and so when it does come out on the camera, he says, oh, there he goes. Right. Um, never. He never had any talk of it being a female. And, and, you know, that's something that's more recent. And the the baby certainly adds to that. The thing that we think, the fact that we think that she could be pregnant or recently postpartum adds to that. But another interesting thing to add to that are the footprints that are left at the site of the footage. Um, and we know that the footprints that are left there um, are 13 and a half inches. Uh, they're about five, five and a half inches wide. They're, they're, they're not real big. Um, and we know that she's fully mature and she's an adult. And the reason that we know this is because her tracks have been found before. They were found in 1991 at Mill Creek Road. They were found at the footage in 92. Uh, they were found again in 96 at Five Points. And it's the same individual that Jeff Meldrum cast when my dad took him there the first time they met. And we can match these tracks and casts up and we can identify that it's the same footprint. And so we have about a six year period uh, of finding her tracks and they don't change in size. Uh, they never get any bigger. So, you know, I can make the conclusion that she's mature and fully grown. And at 13 and a half inches, uh, this has to be a female. This is not a big male. And then on top of that, you add the fact that she looks pregnant and she has a baby. And I think it's right on the spot, you know. Um, Interestingly, Whoa. also enough with that is when she was first found uh, by my dad, at least at Mill Creek Road in 1991. And you can read about this in Vance Orchard's book, Bigfoot of the Blues. Uh, Wes Summerlin immediately recognized the tracks as an individual that he was familiar with that he had seen before. So she actually goes back a little farther than that. Um, and Wes Summerlin had affectionately named this one Big Jim. Because like I said before, they were just all males. That's the way they thought about it. Yeah. Um, and now we know that it's, you know, I have renamed her and I affectionately now refer to her as Big Jill. Jill. Because we know that it's a female. Yeah. Okay. So th is that, that's official, Jill? Um, well, you know, uh, I kind of debated on it and, and, and what I should do. It. And Cliff Berrickman said, well, you know, um, you can name her. It's your responsibility. And so... You know, Jill was the closest thing uh, to Jim. And, and so we, we were talking one day and uh, I just said, you know what, Big Jill, that's what it's going to be. And so I, I've stuck with it since. Yeah. Were there any um, infant tracks ever found in that area, in that whole area? Uh, yeah, close to the area um, in 1992. So same same year, actually uh, in April of 92, four months, about four months prior um, on Gifford Peak which is, is somewhat close. It's within a couple miles. Mm. Uh, there were eight to nine inch tracks that were found. Um, and then in 1995 at Scenic Loop, there were about 11 and a half inch tracks that were found uh, that looked very similar to the ones on Gifford Peak, which could possibly give us somewhat of a clue or insight into some growth rate. If it is the same, yeah. if it is the same individual, you'd be looking at about two and a half, three inches over about three and a half years is the time frame. Well, it gives us kind of an indication that there's a family group. Absolutely. You know, in that Absolutely. area. Yeah. And when the tracks were found um, at Scenic Loop uh, in 1995, when they were about 11 and a half inches, they were found next to 15 inch tracks. Mm. Um, but and when I say 15, it was very muddy through a muddy wheat field. Uh, so they may not actually be that big. That's the substrate was spreading out. And that's kind of how long they measured at. Um, I actually think that it's it's a possibility uh, from looking at pictures of those tracks just because of the foot shape um, that it, it might be Big Jill um, in 1995 again. Unfortunately, there are no footprint casts that were taken from that trackway. Not a single one. Not by my father. Uh, Dar Addington was there with him. David Bean was there. Wes, Bill Lowry. We have found no casts from that trackway. It's interesting. Um, uh, it is unfortunate. Um, what I can yeah. say, though, and I know this because uh, I talked to Dar about this personally, and I have an audio recording from my dad about this trackway. And this, this trackway is going to be in the book, actually. I talk about this trackway and how there were no casts. Uh, the weather was horrible. It was like a downpour of rain. Oh, um, and it was wow. very cold. And they actually went two or three days in a row to look at these. And only kind of on the last day did the, the weather clear up. 
And um, I think by that point, the, the tracks were kind of washed out and ruined, but, but no one took a cast. There's some thought that possibly Dave Bean might have taken one and it could be with his family, with his estate since he's passed away now. Um, but none that's uh, myself or Dar Addington or Cliff Berrickman or Jeff Meldrum can locate. Talk about horrible luck. So, but I wish we, I wish we had casts. Um, so then I could compare them to Big Jill, <laughs> and I could compare the cast to the Gifford Pig juveniles instead of just looking at pictures. Well, let's let's do this. Let's explain because your dad didn't always. Um, your dad was a lone research many many days, but there were right. times where he would obviously connoiter and group in with other researchers. They were doing their own thing. They were finding tracks. Do you want to explain these different people, who they were, and yeah, yeah. how they contributed to basically the uh, the authentic, um, authenticating the fact there were other Bigfoots in that area and that these things were real? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the, the Blue Mountain evidence, which is what we're talking about, a lot yeah. of times it just gets piled on my dad and people just think it's the, the Freeman evidence. Um, and, and it's not the truth. You know, um, there was Wes Summerlin, and he's a really famous name, so a lot of people are going to know him. And he was the elder statesman of that group. And Wes was a, a, a cowboy, and he was a professional man tracker as well. He had actually been hired by the prison um, and the government there in Walla Walla to track escaped inmates, you know, in the past. Mm -hmm. And he had... Um, he's know, not going to get fooled. He's not going to get fooled by fake well, Not easily, at least, right? You know, and... Um, he had sightings and, and had been casting prints since the seventies, you know, so even before my dad came around, so you had Wes uh, and, and Wes and my dad were good friends and, and they were separate, but together. So you, you're right that, you know, sometimes they went together. Sometimes they were separate. Sometimes one found something and then came and got the other one. Uh, you also had in that group, uh, Dave Bean um, and Dave Bean, just like Wes was a professional tracker um, and had worked for the government. Um, and so he was there with them as well. So again, another guy that's not going to be easily fooled. Um, along with that, you had Bill Lowry, who was a biologist and a former game warden. And, and he was on scene there and he was one of those guys. And then uh, Dar Addington as well was part of that group. And she doesn't get enough credit as being one of the pioneer female researchers, uh, you know, especially for that area. She was really the only one. And what's really nice is, is well, it's not nice, but it's nice that Dar is around because Dar is the last surviving member of that entire group. So she's the last one that has, you know, any stories that are firsthand accounts personally. Um, and then aside from her, you had Vance Orchard and, you know, Vance Orchard was a, a journalist and wrote for local newspapers there uh, and was an outdoorsman himself and uh, he and a photographer and, you know, he was with them. So you had two professional trackers, you had a biologist, you had a journalist and a photographer professionally and then you had my father who was uh, raised, you know, hunting, trapping and tracking and was a, a skilled outdoorsman. And it was, you know, a really good group of, of of people that were finding evidence, you know, separately and then including each other into that as well. It, yeah. it wasn't just my dad. I just people need so to realize different backgrounds, different skill sets. And so they're all picking up different pieces. Absolutely. Of the puzzle. You know, and, and one of the things about that group of individuals from the Blue Mountains, different people, different skill sets, different ages, um, not one of those people ever had anything bad to say about anybody else in that group. There was no infighting and there was no jealousy in this group. You know, so super and if they found something, they would and... go get the other person. They would include them. Yeah. So. That's, um, <clears throat> I mean, that says a lot. And this is a part of the story people have not heard. Um, so Dar has contributed to the book. Yes. Um, who else has contributed to the book? Um, let's talk about Jeff Meldrum. Uh, yeah, Dr. Jeff Meldrum has contributed uh, to the book. He was gracious enough to sit down and write a fantastic piece. Yeah. Um, and he um, kind of became acquainted with my father shortly before the end of my father's research and, and actually not long before the end of my father's life. You know, they didn't meet until 1996. So it was a little bit later. Uh, Cliff Berrickman has contributed to the book as well and written a yeah. fantastic piece. And, you know, he's another person he, he never actually got to meet my father, but he's met everybody else. 
you know, and um, he is a supporter of, you know, a lot of the, the evidence that comes out of the Blue Mountains. Um, we talked about Dar. Uh, Doug, of course, you, Mr. Doug Hycheck, yeah. is a contributor to the book and uh, yeah. as being the discoverer of the, the baby footage and, you know, the Freeman footage, a uh, very important piece. And Doug's all, you've also been, you know, kind of trying to enhance this thing for like 20 years. So that's, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, um, I mean, think yeah. about it. This is one of the few pieces of footage where it's not completely obstructed by a brush. It's out right. in the open and it's in full sun. It's out in the open. It's in full sun. Yeah. Um, the only thing that is, Oh, be, before I get into that, let me mention we also have Tom Powell, yeah, uh, school teacher absolutely. from Portland, Oregon, um, and, and a really great guy. I really like Tom Powell and, and uh, a journalist himself has contributed to the book. And then uh, Jonathan Summerlin, who's the grandson of Wes Summerlin, and mm. he is still an active right. researcher there in the blues. Um, he's contributed, you know, to the book as well. Um, what I was going to say is, is the only thing that's really unfortunate about my dad's footage is that it's shot on this eight millimeter digital magnetic tape you know i would have much preferred it be 16 millimeter because then you yeah. could have done something with it yeah. but as, as doug and as you know because you've been trying to enhance it it's only like what 400 pixels or something and when you try to zoom in on it it just blurs out and yeah it was great for convenience at the time it was released but it's it's really not uh and i, I was going to mention one of the one of the main things we did to enhance it is just um digging into the blacks um, changing, you know, lessening the contrast, um, brightening it up so you can dig into those blacks because that's where the detail is. And then using um, um, AI just to stabilize it. And then zoom in, of course, and those things in looping so people can study it, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and that's, of course, how I found the baby. It's only because I had a big monitor. I had it adjusted properly and I could, you know, I had edit software way back in the day when, you know, nobody had edit software back then. And I could, you know, rewind it and then play it back and forth seamlessly. And all of a sudden, I mean, I watch those legs articulate around the waist and then pull away over and over, thousands of times by now. And um, I just, I was just amazed. It's kind of like, well, you can almost ignore the Freeman footage. Just study the baby. Well, yeah. Um, it's funny you say that because I, I had somebody recently tell me basically like that now with with this and, and the enhancements and what we've discovered, this is the important part of the film. Yeah. Uh, and, and I had I had somebody tell me that and I was like, well, you know, you might be right because it's it's something that, you know, we haven't seen. At least it's verifiable. Yeah. And it's fantastic footage, and it might be the most important part of the, the footage, actually. You know, it's something no one knew existed for almost 10 years. Yeah. Plus, you know, if you think about it, I can't think of any other examples that are as clear of an infant. There's none. It's the best. Uh, in the world. Yeah, no examples that are as clear or that are legitimate. You know, right. I, There's I mean, one out there. It's, have, I can tell you, yeah. it's CG. It's CGI, hundred yeah. percent. It's not real. I have yeah. seen a lot of hoaxy looking, you know, videos like that and CGI videos and stuff. But um, yeah, but yeah, footage caught with your dad's credibility, and not just some guy off the internet, you know, <laughs> randomly uploaded. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, I will say as well, since we're talking about my dad and everything, it is, it's also unfortunate that he's probably the world's worst cameraman. Uh, and had no idea what he was doing with uh, a video camera yeah. and wasn't good at it and wasn't zooming in correctly and was shutting it off when maybe he shouldn't have been and for a period of time didn't even realize how to shut it off. Um, you know, technology in his hand yeah. that wasn't a firearm uh, is, is something that, you know, was really unnatural. It, it, and so you see like shaky footage um, at one point in time a couple times actually in the, in the footage, he shuts the camera off when he's trying to locate where it went and try to find yeah. its tracks. Well, and we know now he probably should have just left it roll and just filmed the ground or whatever, you know, but right. um, he didn't, he didn't know. And he was a terrible. Well, let's do this. Guy. Can you explain the scene that leads up to the baby? Can you explain what, what went down in real time versus what you see in the video? 
Does that make sense, uh, my question? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I know what you're asking. Like, yeah. what happened kind of in between? In between, what was okay. he looking for? What what is he? What was he thinking? And then what really went down? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, after the, the initial footage starts and the subject walks from right to left across the screen and does what we call the, the head snap, uh, then it does the little tree hide and everybody's seen this in the footage and, and you can see it better in the enhancements. But then it disappears um, off to the left of the screen. And my dad actually loses it. Uh, and he continues up around the trail. And what kind of happens is he can't find it. And he, we know he shuts the camera off and he shuts the camera off for at least a couple of minutes is kind of the estimation there. Um, and he's actually trying to track it and he's trying to look with his, his eyes, uh, to see where it is and to see if he can find any prints because looking through that viewfinder is terrible. You, you, you can't see anything. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is when the subject in the footage, when it exits to the left off the film, uh, about 20 yards, if you continue to the left there, there's a ravine that drops down about 15 feet that actually drops down to what is the actual deduct spring that feeds into the Walden Pond right there. Okay. Um, and then the watershed is right on the other side of that. Um, and so the direction it's moving is, is towards that ravine and towards the watershed. Uh, when he finally does pick it back up um, and we see the part of the footage that is now known as the, the baby lift footage, what he actually thinks is that he sees a second individual Sasquatch. And he says, oh, there's two of them, I guess. You know, and then you hear him say, oh, two of them, you know, and you can see that he's, you know, you can hear his voice. He's kind of a little bit worried. By the um, way, I, I, and sorry to interrupt, but when yeah. I hear that, cause I've heard it so many times, I, I have to work. Right. But as like the enhancements were trying to be made, like, you know, just on a loop, it gives me chills. Like every single time, like the authenticity of just even like, just listening to your dad. Oh, when he says he's that, like there's two of them. Oh yeah. And he's, he, you can tell like he's yeah. unsettled by the whole thing. Yeah. And then he's, like, he's like, Oh, two. Of, and you can tell he's getting worried because you know, obviously if you're dealing with one wild animal or, or one Sasquatch of the unknown, that's one thing. But when you get another one in there, you know, then the chance of the unknown, <laughs> yes. multiplies, right. Especially yes. if it has a child, which he didn't realize at the time, but um, yeah, he thought there was two of them. And what he thought was, is that was a different one that was, that was coming out in front of him um and that the other one was still behind him uh and i don't think that's the case i i think the one that he sees that picks the baby up i think it's the only one that's in the footage i yeah. think it's the one that walks in front and i think he overshot it and it went in a direction that he didn't suspect and uh there's a couple of different variations of story or not story but uh thought process on how it gets from point a to point b um, it could have traveled through the trees in kind of in a direct beeline to where the, that infant is, you know, hiding along the way. And if it doesn't want to be seen, it's not going to be seen. And we know that from the tree hide portion of it. Um, there's a possibility it could have went down the ravine and traveled down the ravine and, and, and came back up, um, and, and got the baby. And no one really knows cause I wasn't there and nobody else that has a theory on that was there. And we were not sure how long the camera was turned off for. Um, so we're not quite sure if it's two minutes or five minutes and that makes a huge difference, you know, on Absolutely. what path it could have taken. Mm -hmm. but, uh, basically, you know, to answer your question, yeah, he lost it. It went out of sight. Um, he was trying to find tracks to follow it. Um, he had put the camera down and, and turned it off and then the camera comes back on because he notices what he thinks is the second one and he turns right. the camera back on to show us, but it's not, I I'm almost hundred percent certain it's the same one. Um, that surprised him by its location, which goes to show you how good they are at hiding and, and maneuvering. Cause so. my dad was no dummy when it came to tracking animals, you know, um, and it plucks that baby up. And, um, you know, one thing we know is, is after it plucks the baby up, it turns around and, and then it, it does for certain drop back down, uh, into that ravine after it picks the baby up. Because if you look at that footage close enough, and if you zoom it real in, you can see moving black pixels uh that are in the bush that kind of drop down like it almost looks like maybe the top of her head that drops drops into the ravine and, and it's very very difficult to see but it's there so well one of the one of the things that i do when i'm looking at you know footage i get footage every week i listen to the audio you cannot fake audio right. you can't fake the authenticity it's so easy for me at least I, i'm gifted at it um at least i think i am 
that I can, I can, you know, spot bad acting. And there's so many uh, pieces of footage out there. Just listen to the audio. You can tell it's not real. It's staged. People are, you know, people, unless they've gone to acting school and have really learned a lot of method acting, they're not going to be able to pull off an audio hoax. Like Alex said, the first time he heard it gave him chills because he knew it was authentic. Right. You know, it passed that, that three second rule. Which is, um, you know, it's kind of funny because one of the, um, like, uh, criticisms that I, I hear from people from time to time is, oh, God, he was he was such a terrible actor, you know, like maybe if he had taken an acting class, like, you know, this would be more believable. But it, but it's always criticism that's coming from people that didn't know my dad and, and they weren't around him. And I can tell you uh, 100% for certain that's exactly how he talked, you know. Um, and nothing that's said in there is out of the ordinary for him, um, except for the fact that maybe he didn't drop the F bomb like 20 times. Cause you know, he, he, he cussed a lot, you know, sometimes, but, uh, the, the one thing I can tell you, I mean, is that, you know, he, he's, he's out of breath, you know, he's genuinely excited and people need to keep in mind as well that it wasn't his first sighting. So it's not the first time he's seen one of these things, you know, um, and, you know, as we'll find out you know, in the book, and it's not really a secret, but it's not even the first time that he got one of these things, you know, potentially on, on film. And and so it's not like he's screaming mad and, and running for the hills. You know, we've, we've had sightings before. We've been close before. Um, he's doing what he always does. He's a researcher and he's got his camera and you can tell that he's excited and you can tell when the right moment hits, when he thinks there's two of them, his voice changes and there's a little worry that you can you can hear in there. Yes. Uh, yes. And then he starts to, you know, think that maybe he shouldn't be there anymore, which is, you know, it, precisely, you know, what you're hearing in that. So well, I, and I think I think in the back of his his mind, he was kind of subconsciously working on a documentary throughout his entire life. Uh, well, he was working on a book. No, I, I, I mean, know, I know that. But you know, when he got that video camera. I think he was in his mind kind of thinking, well, maybe someday, you know, a documentary can, put, can yeah. be put out, which is maybe. why he was narrating. And, and you know, the other thing, yeah, it's, it's nice that you bring that up, too, because a lot of people just think that this is the first time he showed up anywhere with a video camera. Yeah. No, he just happened to be filming, which is not true. And you guys know this um, because we have uh, footage that no one's ever seen that's going in the book. And, you know, a lot of it's just footage of you know, following trackways, looking at tracks, talking to other people, like saying, oh, here's my dog running around, you know, or filming the watershed, his truck. And and there's um, other footage that I have that's not going to the book either, you know, stuff like that. And there's like hours of it where once he got an actual video camera that was his, um, he was filming everything. He was filming casting tracks and and he was filming driving and, and he was filming talking to people and he had made yeah. film at Deed Up Creek before, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and so this was not actually out of the ordinary for him to be filming tracks as he's like walking up this trail. We, we, we've seen it before and we're going to see it in the book. I'm going to show you, you know, video in the book that's very similar uh, to what he did on that day, yeah. uh, you know. And, and so um, you're right. He was narrating. He was always talking to the camera. When he was yeah. doing anything, he was telling us, oh, these are juvenile prints at Gifford Peak. Oh, they look to be about eight inches long, maybe something like that. Oh, this is what maybe I think it did. Um, so, yeah, maybe in the back of his mind, he was. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it was conscious. Documentary, you know. Yeah, I think it was just kind of a subconscious <laughs> that he was at some point, if he ever had enough material, he would go to somebody and say, hey, can you put this stuff together? Yeah, maybe, you know, you know and uh you know, I do know like the, the audio files I have, uh, the, the cassette recordings that we're going to use in the book, his intention with those was to record himself telling a story and to eventually have someone type it into like a book, like a novel, oh, okay. you know, or, or whatever. Uh, I mean, he, and he tells us in his audio recordings and uh, I, I'm not sure I use that part in the book, but there's one in general where he talks about like, when I write my book you know, this is going to be in there, like type thing. And that was his intention. And unfortunately he passed away before he ever got the chance to do that. And, yeah. you know, he was kind of, you know, he was in bad health and he was kind of out of 
uh, Bigfoot research at that time. And, and, and so there was a book that was never able to be, you know, accomplished that way. But uh, I'm going to do it for him. And even though I do have a small part in this book and I have written some chapters and I've supplied the audio and the video and, and the pictures and all that, this is Paul Freeman's book. I mean, this is my dad's book. You know, it's my name's just going to go on it. I'm just I'm just helping it get out there. Can can we talk about the watershed? Because Bigfoot has always been a geographic problem. Right. It, you have to have woods, water, and hills. Generally, you need all three to have sightings. Woods, water, right. and hills. And in this case, you've got a, a water, which is pretty rare in that area, and a lot of it. Do you want to explain the whole Mill Creek watershed better so the audience understands? Uh, well, the springs and yeah, I um, it has just come to my knowledge recently that some states don't have watersheds. I didn't, I didn't know this. I, I mean, where I was raised, you know, we always had a watershed, and uh, it's an area that supplies the drinking water for. The surrounding cities um right. and, and that area is off limits to civilians you you have to be uh, a government employee to, to be able to go in there it's very protected to keep it clean um and so that's what you know the, the mill creek uh municipal watershed there is in the, in the umatilla national forest and it supplies the water for walla walla and uh, milton free water oregon and dayton and waitsburg and some in some of those smaller towns um and just the fact that it's off limits to the public makes it fantastic yeah. in the first place exactly. um, and what a lot of people don't realize is is that watershed is connected to what is called the winnaha toucan and wilderness area um and that wilderness area is one hundred and eighty thousand acres with no roads you can only go in there on horseback or on foot um mm -hmm. and it, it's area that is completely inaccessible um there's area, there's parts of it you can't get to the, and, and you couldn't get into in the winter if you wanted to go in there. Um, and one of my, my father's theories actually was that that might be where the Sasquatch in this area were spending winters was deep in that wilderness area. And we couldn't even get in there if we wanted to, you'd have to be dropped in in a helicopter uh, and you probably wouldn't make it out. And, and, and so it's, it's so inaccessible that uh, the odds of even seeing one in there are, are very remote, but um yeah, I mean, th this area around the Blue Mountains with the watershed and with the Winnehaw Toucan and Wilderness, I mean, you're looking at, you know, the wilderness area itself, 180,000 square acres, no roads. <laughs> the watershed is off limits to the public. You have to be a government employee to get in there. Um, and that is connected to public land. Um, and it's this public land, D-Duck Spring, you know, most notably that has the most viable water source. And so you get a lot of sightings and you get a lot of reports coming out of the watershed into these areas uh, where there is heavy water. Yeah, and the, the Blue Mountains in general are arid. Part of, part of the Blue Mountains are very arid. I mean, water can be quite scarce. There. Yeah, well, it's it's high desert, you know, the surrounding yeah. area there, eastern Washington, so they can be yeah. arid. Um, and one thing also about the Blue Mountains, if you've never been there, you, they were, people don't realize how steep they are, actually. Uh, and how rugged they are once you get off trail like you'll you'll be surprised uh yeah. when you get there it, it's not some place that you go to areas you've never been where you're out of range you know from cell phone or, or whatever like that without maps or the proper equipment um it, it's 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 not an area that you want to mess around with you know in that sense but yeah they they are arid um there's not a tremendous amount of water there, which is one thing that makes D-Duck Spring really, really important. Well, let's talk about the spring a bit. Is this a spring that you could see water bubbling up? Is it a pond? Is it a waterfall? What do you know? Describe the spring. Yeah, well, um, what we refer to as D-Duck Spring and, and what you see in the, in the, the footage as he's looking at the footprints uh, next to the water's edge is actually what's called Walden Pond at D-Duck Trailhead. So it, it's a pond, Walden Pond. Um, D-Duck Spring itself is this little tiny trickle of spring that comes out of the ground 
and feeds into the pond and it runs down this ravine. It, it's not like it's a river or a waterfall or anything like that. It literally comes out of the ground, but, um, um, runs but for it, a race, and then and it feeds into this pond. But um, it would but, be a great, great source of fresh, clean drinking water. It's a great source of fresh, clean drinking water. Yeah, yeah. and it has been for a long time because um, I, I believe it used to be a stagecoach route that like ran by there, which is where the, the old road comes from. You know, they used to stop stagecoaches there uh, and water horses and, and, and people as well or, or whatever, but uh, it's, it's clean water. It's cold water. Uh, my dad referred to it as being sweet water. I'm not quite sure what that means, but he, he would have known, I guess that means it's mm -hmm. pleasant to drink, yeah. um, yep. you know, and uh, there's a lot of it and it doesn't dry up no matter how hot it gets, no matter what the yeah. summers are like it always runs because it comes straight out of the ground and the pond never dries up. And so the elk use it, the deer use it, all kinds of animals use it and the Bigfoot use it. So Michael, like what, what, what do you feel like people misunderstand the most about your dad and his research? misunderstand the most um i think there's a lot of rumors um and and, and speculation that, that kind of surround him uh most of which coming from the the mid to or the early to to mid 80s from some things that other people said or you know everyone is familiar with the the good morning america episode and, and kind of what happened you know on there i beat that into the ground you know lately um but yeah, I, I mean, I think people don't realize my dad was not a believer in Bigfoot he, um, in, until 1982 when he saw one. And he was he was a person who was actually spoken, outspoken against the existence of something like that. And, you know, he thought that was crazy talk, you know, pretty much. Um, but, you know, uh, to get in and to really answer your question, I here, I have an answer for you on my question. OK, um, I, I, I've heard lately. You know, there's been some things mentioned, and one of the things I've heard is, is a quote that said, you know, Paul Freeman was either the luckiest Bigfoot or alive, or he's a complete fraud, you know, and, and I think it's neither, actually. And the reason people say that is because they think he's too lucky because he found so many footprints. But, yeah, let's but, take yeah, but, but Michael, no. your dad made his own luck. Well, Big he did. Time. And, you know, here's the thing is we have, and I'm going to give you an estimate because we can't locate all of the casts. Um, and, and when I say we, I mean me and, and Jeff Meldrum and, and, you know, Cliff Berrickman and other researchers, we have missing casts from my dad's collection. Like, for example, we know that there were at least two plaster casts poured at D-Duck Spring the day after the footage was shot, but we only know where one of them is. Uh, we don't know where the other one is, and we don't know if there was more than that that were made. Um, so I'm going to use an estimate for you, but in my dad's 15 years of research in the Blue Mountains, we have between 45 and 50 plaster casts that he made. Um, so that's around about three a year is, is kind of what the average is there. He's making three casts a year. Some years had more, some had less. Um, in six days in 1982, when he had his first sighting, and then they found the dermals six days later at Elk Wallow, we have seven of those plaster casts that, that come from that six day period. Okay. But the, the average scope out of all of them is about three a year. Um, yeah. And then you, you look at, he was taking between three and five casts usually from each trackway yeah. that he found. Okay. So now you're looking at, he was finding on average about one legitimate trackway per year. Uh, for a guy that was in the mountains three to four days a week, at least, you know, sometimes yeah. up for two weeks at a time, one track way a year um, is not that many. No. Lines, you well, know? Didn't, didn't, didn't he used to write your mother goodbye letters and romance letters because he was going to be gone so long? Yeah, not so much romance letters, I, I don't think. But yeah, goodbye letters. And, and one thing he used to do is he would give her instructions on what to do if he doesn't come back. Like, this is where I'm going. Wow. If I don't come back, call this person, right? Have them come look for me. Yep. And then I do know that one of the things he told my mom, and I believe this audio clip will be in the book, is that if they find my dead body, 
the first thing I want you to look for is my camera because whatever wow. killed me is going to be on the camera and don't you dare let anybody else have it. <sighs> uh, you know, and that, that's one of the things that, that he would tell her, you know. But, um, but by the way, by the way, uh, it's a gr great time to ask. Could we play one, just one of his, part of his, one of his audio clips so the audience can at least hear his voice? Do you have one to play? Oh, I bet you Alex can take one. I should have thought. <laughs> I should have thought. Put me on this. the spot. I can. I can dig it up. Um, do you know like a QR code, uh, or uh, kind of a you know what I mean? One of the audios I could I could pull up. Oh man, the, uh, you're, you're asking me. Copy. Well, I think I might have some on my phone. I could probably play one. Here. Yeah, you probably you got some on your phone. Well, you know, I, I probably have some on my phone as well. Well, just hold it up to your mic. I don't know how well it would. I don't know how well it would come through. It'll come through great. Okay, let me let me look and see what I got here. Yeah, so, I just think so, it would be cool. So it sounds like I mean the biggest thing is these people that are you know critical of your father had no idea how much time he spent out in the woods. Yes, yeah, exactly. A lot of them, yeah, no they have idea. no idea how much time he spent in the woods. They have no idea how good he was at hunting and tracking, and how much yeah. how devoted he was to it. And he was in the right spot, you know. And also on top of it, he wasn't the only person, and we talked about that earlier. There were other people there at the time with him that were finding evidence as well. So it's not like he was, he wasn't the only one, but everybody wants to just kind of pile it on him. Uh, let well, me well, th here. well, think about, think about this. Um, so here's this high desert area and there's one area where there's good water, drinking water. Right. Why in the world wouldn't they hang around that area or at least visit it a few times a day or once a day? It narrowed the whole search down. It narrowed the whole search down. Yeah. And to, to be honest with you, if you've never seen it, uh, my, my father's Forest Service map, uh, which hangs in the North American Bigfoot Center now. The Cliff is the, the curator of it there. And it, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. If you've never seen it, you need to go look at it. Um, it has 10 years worth of tracks and sightings um, and possible nest finds and hair finds and broken branches. And not just by my dad. And not just by the other people, but anything that they would hear uh, would be documented on that map. And so we have just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of documentation on this map of the watershed. Um, and if you look at it, it's, it's quite amazing because D-Duck Spring is just this area. Um, and it's by far the most active area for the Sasquatch activity on the entire map. And then it just radiates out from it like this. And it kind of gets... Um, less and less and less as it as it goes, but there is something about D Duck Spring, and I think it's something more than just water. There, there's something about that place, um, and uh, you know the map and that information really is what led him to get that footage. And he was kind of ahead of his time because he was almost tracking migratory patterns. Um, is what he was trying to do to pinpoint where they were going to be, and he was doing this like yeah. in, in the mid '80s you know, in his garage on a map that he was only sharing with a couple of other people, yeah. you know, and, and not the entire world. But uh, there's some fantastic stuff on there. And, and, and that map directly led to, you know, him knowing that they were going to be at Deduct in late August, especially on hot summers, which are about every two or three, you know, and they were going to be getting water there. And we have yeah. 10 years of history of this before he got footage. Like, I mean, he knew where they were going to be. Well, let's talk about the soil where the tracks were found. So we're talking about moist soil. The soil um, was moist. Uh, moist around the pond. Yeah. Right. You know, um, I'm there. I do know the soil in the blues, and I can't remember the name for it, and Dr. Jeff Meldrum can, can tell you, but the, 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 the Blue Mountains in particular have a, a special kind of, of soil um, that is about the uh, consistency of flour. I guess, and they call it maybe mountain flower or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it's really uh, fantastic for capturing like fine details, details yeah. footprints, like dermal ridges. And I would imagine it's a mixture have, of the Blue Mountains happen to have a, a lot of it. Uh, yeah. and so it's a mix. It's a mixture of like volcanic ash and clay and silica and and um, yeah. Did you want fine. me to play one of these? Audio yeah, love it, there? love it. Do it. Um, how long are we looking at? Oh, we just. Play a little clip here. Play a little clip. All right. How about like 30 Turn, seconds or so? Sure. Whatever you want. Just to sure. give people an idea of this entire video diary. Or... 
are we playing? Hold on. I think it'll be really interesting for people to hear kind of the true Paul in this video diary. I mean, you really get to know him. Can we hear that? Yep. My name's Paul Freeman. I got a story to tell you. I was 39 years old when it happened to me. Now I'm 51. I've been doing the research. Uh, Hold it closer, Michael. Kind of Mike. it. And uh, I'm going to tell you a story about Bigfoot. Cool. I don't know how well you can hear that, but oh, you can hear it. Sure, you can hear it. Okay, okay. Yep, it's just so yeah. cool. Uh, it's going to be cool. I, I love the fact that um, you know people can pick the book up and they can read. You know this stuff I wrote and stuff like you know Dr. Jeff Meldrum and, and, and Cliff wrote and all this this stuff. But then they can hear my dad tell his own story in his yeah. own voice you know, over, over top of all of this and, and some of it being the same stuff that I'm talking about or other people are talking about or relates to it. And some of it just being, you know, kind of funny stuff about hunting mushrooms or, you know, something like that. Um, but just to hear his voice and to let him be able to have a part in the book, I think is, is fantastic. Yeah. I, I would describe your dad as a gentle badass. <laughs> uh, badass meaning uh, no 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 what i mean by badass he just he just he went out in those he was almost a mountain man well he, he went he out there man. and he I mean, just pardon i i was just talking to someone last night actually about this um that he should have been a frontiersman yeah. maybe, maybe he was in a past life you know, maybe because he loved the mountains. There was no place else he would rather be. My dad, actually, I, I kind of described him as almost like a wild animal that was in a cage by society. Like he had to live in a house and he had to have a job to support his family. Um, but he would have been just as happy, like living out in the, in the woods as a fur trapper or, you know, one of the old mountain men, you know, back in the day, maybe, maybe that's what he should have done, you know? And uh, I actually have a, um, you know, there's a little audio clip in the book where he, he kind of talks about something similar and I won't play that today because it's kind of long, but, uh, you know, him talking about how that, that would be his paradise, you know, as if he could, as if he could do that. And, you know, he, he also admits as he got older that he was probably gone from home more than he should have been, you know, and he, he should maybe have been a more, mm -hmm. you know, uh, present like husband or, or, or father, but, um, he was doing what he loved to do. And, and yeah. I can't help him for that, but uh, you know, he was gentle. He was very kind. My dad was very kind. He was very yeah. friendly. He was very helpful. He would talk to anybody. He would give you the shirt off of his back. He'd do anything he could to help you. He became known for giving away casts um, and pictures and hair samples and stuff. And, and this is part of the reason why we can't locate some of these casts is somebody has them in their house somewhere because he handed it to them you know, and gave it away. But yeah, at the same time, um, you know, he was, um, he was a big man and he was a strong man and, uh, he had been, you know, uh, in his younger days, uh, a golden gloves boxer. Um, he was he, kind of a rough and tumble kind of guy. He had been kind of a bar brawler. Um, he'd worked as a, a bouncer, um, in those type of situations, and a lot of people don't know as well um, that he was a bodyguard for Ricky Nelson and Chuck Berry when they would come to Portland, Oregon or Seattle to do concerts. Um, and so he protecting those guys as well. And um, yeah, I, I guess he, he was a badass. He really yeah, was. And he when was. you throw in his survival skills in the mountain, um, there's nobody else I would rather be with if I was in one of those situations. And anything that he would tell you, his word out there would be law. You know, yeah. but um, at the same time, you think a man like that, a hard man would be a hard family man and like a hard father, but he wasn't ever. And none of us ever felt unloved. Uh, we were hardly ever disciplined. I can't even remember my dad ever spanking me, not once in my entire life, um, but I knew better. And you just knew to not push dad 
I guess if that makes sense, like you just kind of yeah. grew up that way where he didn't have to do that. All he had to do was tell you to stop or look at you. And that's what he did is you stop, <laughs> you know, um, but he was very gentle, very kind, very, very loving, you know, and um, very street smart and very wood smart, but not educated. You know, he never yeah. finished the ninth grade. He was, he was not a, a book literate, educated man whatsoever. What, what about his job? Can you describe his job um, when he worked for the Forest Service? Yeah. Um, when he worked for the Forest Service, he, he was what they call a, a boundary patrolman um, and or an outrider. Outriders generally are on, on horseback. Um, and he did do that some. Um, but he was also a boundary patrolman that had a service vehicle that he drove. Um, and on uh, June 10th, 1982, when he had his, his first encounter with Bigfoot, his original sighting, he was he was in a vehicle um, that he he had uh, parked to follow a, a herd of elk. So he'd gotten out of it and he was on foot. But you know, daily duties. Uh, he had a 25 square mile radius of the watershed that he patrolled. Uh, just keep people out of there. Make sure there were no trespassers. There were no poachers. He could write tickets if people you know were inside the boundary or kindly ask them to leave. Uh, he could write tickets if people were driving on the wrong side of the road or if they were had campfires when it was you know. Uh, they weren't allowed to just things like that, you know, basically just maintaining uh, the privacy of the restrictions on civilians from entering the watershed. But th but that gave him special access. Well, he could go in there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it gave him special access. Exactly. I mean, it's kind of a perfect um, setup for a Bigfoot researcher. Um, well, he wasn't a researcher at the time, though. You no, know, right. You keep in mind that, you know, what? when he had his initial encounter, he wasn't a believer. And so he didn't, he didn't know that it was perfect access, you know, for that. Um, and then, you know, shortly after his initial encounter, after they'd found the, the tracks of Elk Wallow, you know, that forest service job came to an end. And I, I think it's a common misconception that people think he was a forest service employee for a long time. He was actually in the work for the forest service for like two, two and a half months. It was a very short lived job. <clears throat> um, so uh, after that, he did not have, special access uh, per se anymore, which doesn't mean that he didn't give himself special access. Yeah. But I'm not. Well, he, <laughs> he knew the area well. and He knew so the area let's... well. He knew where they watched. He knew where the patrolmen were. Uh, he knew where you could get into the watershed and get out yeah. and not be detected. Yeah. Um, not saying that he would ever really <laughs> go into the watershed or that there was ever any evidence found inside the boundary of the watershed when he was no longer an employee. I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> but if he had wanted to, he certainly knew how to have done that. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can you tell us about his first sighting? Uh, yeah. So um, June 10th, 1982 in the morning, he'd been on job about uh, one month at the time. And he was driving up Tiger Canyon Road in his uh, service pickup. And he had seen a herd of elk cross the road and go up an old logging spur. Um, and he'd actually been asked by the game biologist in Walla Walla if he could keep a count on the, the calves of the elk. And they were trying to, they were trying to keep a, a head count on them. And so he decided to get out and follow this herd and walk down this old logging road so he could see if there were any calves with him. And he got about uh, uh, three quarters of a mile, I think, when he started to crest this little little hill in the road, when he started to notice uh, just this, this foul smell, like something musky and, and, and something dead kind of mixed together at the, at the same time. Um, and, and just about the time he started to notice the smell, he kind of came right around a little uh, bend and... Um, here was this, you know, in his own words, this critter that was, you know, maybe uh, 60 yards ahead of him. And it was up on the, the sloping bank where they had done some clear cutting uh, coming down. And it, it stepped about 10 feet off the bank down into the road and stopped to look at him uh, long enough that he has provided us with some great details, you know, that he can see the stomach muscles moving. And uh, he can see that the the hair on its the nape of its neck and its shoulders and head uh, kind of furled up like, you know, the hackles of a dog. Um, and then it made like a, a guttural kind of low growl almost at him. Um, and he took a couple steps backward 
uh, and then it, it actually turned and, and kind of walked. Um, and he watched it go for two or 300 yards, uh, eventually went up over a hill into some some forest and disappeared. And in, in the time of that, it, it turned back to look at him uh, two or three times, I think, to, to make sure that he was in his place. Um, and um, after it disappeared, he, he started to run back to his truck and, and had hooked his heel and fell down over a rock. He lost his keys in the road. I mean, he was all kinds of, you know, miscombobulated. Um, and there's an account from two employees, actually, uh, one which he talks about, and I believe the man's name is Dave. Uh, when he got back to the ranger cabin, Dave was trying to flag him down and say, hey, Paul, hey, Paul, Paul, is everything OK? Uh, my dad went right past him and apparently never even realized that he was talking to him. Um, and then more recently, I, I have heard from someone who has uh, a friend that worked for the, the Forest Service at the time um, that said later, uh, that he was he, hours later, he was still pale, um, after that sighting, even after his superiors had gotten there. And, and that was a story I've heard more recently that kind of got passed down that it, I had never heard before. Uh, but you know, um, it's funny cause you know, you hear about, you know, different sizes of Sasquatch and, and all that stuff. And in my dad's initial encounter, when he first sees it and what he, what he first tells his superiors in the newspaper is, God, this thing is, it's got to be nine feet tall. It's towering, you know, over him and, and all this stuff. And then later in life, after he had a few more sightings and after the d video, he says, well, maybe it was seven feet tall, you know, or whatever. But, um, and I always kind of laugh in comparison to that when I hear people talk about like 12 feet tall, Sasquatch, 11, 12 feet tall or whatever, because I, I do think the human brain uh, does funny things to you when you're in shock or when you're in fear. And sometimes you can interpret things as being much larger than they actually are. And where my dad initially thought something was maybe over nine feet tall, realized later that it, it really wasn't. Um, but we're probably looking at seven, seven and a half feet tall uh, with a, a strong belief that this one actually was a male. Super interesting. Do you think um, that your mom could have been more supportive of his sighting. Like did, like, did she believe him? Did um, she support his research? Did, you know. She supported his research. Yeah. No, there, there's no way my mother could have been more supportive of my mom. Okay. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, they probably, they almost got divorced uh, probably, you know, enough times to count on one hand at least, you know, over this. Um, because there was just so much stress and, you know, I spoke earlier of him being gone three or four days a week. Well, when you're in the mountains three or four days a week, you're not working, you know, you're not at your job three or four of those days. And so, you know, a lot of the time he had a part-time job or he had a night job where he was working night shifts and then he was going in the day and he was spending all day in the mountains. And my mother wasn't seeing him for up to two weeks at a time. And there's financial burden with not working as much as maybe you should be and, and having three kids and a wife at home and, you know, just support burden, you know, at home. And uh, when my grandmother, Margaret, died, my mother's mom, and she left her home to my mom, we lived there for about a year or two in that particular house. And they sold it uh, to support Bigfoot research. You know, um, so they actually could, you know, move back up to towards Walla Walla and my, and my dad could have money to, to do that. And I remember, you know, uh, things being sold all the time, you, you know what I mean? And um, him working odd jobs, you know, here and there. But one of the things about my mother is, um, you know, my, my dad gets a lot of credit for being kind of ahead of his time and documenting evidence so well. Uh, yeah. for his period of research but my mother's the one that 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 did a lot of that and she documented all the pictures and and she documented uh, and put together you know uh, display boards for when he would go to the mall or if he would go to a conference and talk and she typed letters of correspondence but my mom actually worked really tirelessly to catalog and document contracts and letters and pictures and do all these things and putting up with a husband that sometimes she didn't know whether he was alive or dead you know, or, or if he was home and, and then trying to raise three children and eventually going back to school and, and going to a community college to get, you know, a degree and going, you know, to work for an accountant so she could support the family more. Um, and my dad could have more time, you know, to go and, and devote to this. Uh, 
And I can't say anything except that she must have believed him. Yeah. And I, I have never heard make those sacrifices. Mother, yeah. I, I've never heard my mother ever actually, to be honest with you, ever say that she did or she didn't. I, I, I don't think she had to, she had to have believed him, yeah. you know, um, and what was going on. Um, otherwise there, there wouldn't have been so much, so much dedication there because my dad never made any money off of Bigfoot. I, I've ever, I mean, he did a, a commercial for Dryer's ice cream in 1987, which was the single most amount of money he ever made for anything Bigfoot related in his entire life. And I think it, I'd have to look at the contract, but I think it was $2,300. Uh, wow. And he never got anything like that for the footage, maybe 1200, I think, or something like that. Uh, Doug, you may actually have provided that to him uh, for licensing on the footage. I think that's the most he yeah. ever got for it. Yeah. You know, I mean, people that think he was doing this for the money and he he could be out there, like, that's crazy. I, I, they I mean, have to be we, insane, we it, it, born, knowing that background. You know, I mean, we didn't do without. I, I, I never did without. You know, don't get me wrong. We always had Christmas and we had shoes for school. You know, and we always have stuff like that. Um, it was my parents that did without because everything they had went to their children, you know, and then to my father's like my father's research. But we, we didn't have we didn't have money growing up. We never had new cars. And and uh, after they my parents sold the house that my grandmother had left them, we never owned a home. My parents, they rented for their entire lives and, and, until they died, um, you know, and, and every car that was ever owned was bought run down and then fixed by my dad. So, you know, it, it would work, um, you know, to the point where he was reusing, you know, the videotapes and the camera and filming over stuff because we, yeah. couldn't, afford, we couldn't afford to buy new ones, you know, and even the camera that he has was given to him by my uncle Larry. Uh, and that was given to him by somebody else. So my dad had a third hand crummy, you know, eight millimeter, camera which is what he was he was living off of you know, so. well i want to i want to switch gears here so there was there was a um set of circumstances that was different the day he filmed the footage yes he was he was delayed as i remember he Do was delayed tell yeah. that story yeah tell tell yeah. that story uh so my dad was working nights at the time um and he he had been getting off work about four four thirty in the morning um, getting ready and, and going up to, you know, to D-Duck Spring. It's about an hour and a half drive from where we were in Walla Walla. So he would be getting there anytime, you know, between 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning is, is when he would arrive and he would sit in his car and he would watch the pond. And then eventually, you know, day would fully break uh, and he would get out and look for signs around the pond's edge or tracks. And the, the week that the footage was captured, my dad had been to D-Duck in the pond there every day of the week because he knew that they were going to be there. He knew they were going to be there. Um, and he just thought, God, they're coming earlier. You know, they're, they're coming, they're getting water, they're leaving. He had the, you know, he said the timing wrong is what it, it ends up being. And uh, the, the night before he got the footage, uh, he got a phone call from my sister, Linda, and her car wouldn't start. And she asked him if he would come over in the morning to fix it. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And, you know, he went to work that night and he got off and he came home and he got a little sleep and he got up in the morning and he got his cup of coffee. And then he went to my sister's house and he fixed her car and got it running. And this was about 9 a.m. in the morning. And I'll get into this in a sec because there's some, you know, debate on that. Um, and he started to drive home because he had no plans to go to d -Duck. And then he just kind of thought, well, hey, you know, what the heck? Um, I'll go up there. Maybe I'll find some fresh footprints. You know, where else would he rather be anyway, except in the mountains? My mom was at work and, you know, I was going to be hanging out with buddies that day or whatever. And so, yeah, he, you know, turned his truck around and he drove up there and uh, he got there. I say debatable because some people think he got there about nine o'clock in the morning. I don't think that's true. I think he left my sister's house about nine o'clock in the morning and he got there at about 1030. Um, and I think the film was shot probably between 1030 and, and 11 a.m. somewhere in there. And I, I'm pretty sure I'm accurate on this. Um, but uh, so he got there up to possibly four and a half hours later, almost five hours than he normally was there. And um, yeah, the rest is history. Walked right up on one, you know, got there. There's Prince. They'd been there. And it, it you know, it comes right out in front of him. 
but I think it's solely due to the fact that his timing was off and, you know, they're obviously higher intelligence. They would know that he was there. They would get used to his routine, at least his scent. You know, they would know that he was coming about 6 a.m. in the morning. And I think where he made the mistake and he thought that they were coming early and then leaving, and what was actually happening was they were coming and they were watching for him and they were waiting for him to leave. And then they were probably coming and getting their water and watering their young. And that day when he wasn't there, you know, uh, yeah, they came out and he surprised them and, and, you know, they made a mistake. But um, if my sister's car was more reliable, we may not have any food. <laughs> Yeah, you know? it's, yeah, that's or what she, happens. She better care of it because odds are, and I don't remember what was wrong with it, but it was probably something that was due to her not, you know, maintaining it. So, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, there's there was a little chance and a little luck that, that went into him capturing that. So he comes home. What does he do? What do you do? Uh, I'm at home with some buddies of mine, actually. We are in the basement. Um, we're playing some video games, just, you know, wasting time and we heard my dad you know felt him i always say we felt him we heard my dad uh come through the door you know he's 275 pounds he's slamming the door and stomping around and he's actually yelling for my mother not remembering that my mom's at work you know because she was had a job and she was working at this point in time um so he doesn't remember that she's there and of course me and my friends come upstairs uh because of all the excitement and, and what's going on um, and you know, gosh, I, I repeat it all the time. I tell people, it's one of the things I talk about, but you can instantly tell that something was off. You know, he, he was, he was spooked. Um, and that's not something that you saw with my dad, but, uh, visibly shaking and pale, um, excited. Um, and I remember, uh, Jonathan Summerlin actually, uh, talks about this a little bit sometimes how, Later that day, actually, after he came home, he went to West Summerlin's house and Jonathan Summerlin was, Summerlin was there. And uh, Jonathan Summerlin states that my dad was not in a normal mental frame of mind, I think is how he puts it. Something like that, like something something was just different that day um, that scared my dad. But uh, me and a couple of buddies of mine are the first ones that ever got to watch that footage uh, when that little eight millimeter camera was plugged into the television. And I, what do you say? I mean, you go, what the hell, you know, it's not a bear and it's obviously not a man. And uh, I think we, I don't even know how many times we watched it, you know, before he packed up and made a phone call and, and went off to West Summerlin's house. But I've still got a friend that, you know, still talks about it, you know, to this day from, from 30 years ago. Every time I see him, he brings it up because he was there. So did did his um, behavior change after he nailed the footage? He got the footage. Was he even more obsessed to go get more footage? Or did um, he just take it man. say, hey, I accomplished what I wanted? No, not necessarily. I, I, it wasn't one or the other. So, you know, something that happens with the footage, and, mm -hmm. and he does talk about uh, in some interviews later, is that during the footage when he got that, um, he had a voice, he felt like a voice or he heard a voice inside of him, something that told him, this is enough, you're too close and you need to leave this alone. Uh, otherwise you may not make it home safely the next time. Like wow. he had kind of one of those feelings. And so, you know, it wasn't like, uh, I wouldn't say more obsessed afterwards or less. Um, there were no more sightings. There were no more, you know, footage, you know, tapes made. There were no more pictures taken. There, there were casts found and there were prints found uh, for a short amount of time, you know. Um, but chalk it up to this or chalk it up to that, whether he just wasn't lucky enough after that or if he wouldn't allow himself to get close enough after that. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have any more sightings. Um, also something, you know, I would like to bring up moving past that a couple of years um, and I just talked to Jeff Meldrum about this in Pocatello, Idaho. We had a conversation about this, actually, is that my dad became a lightning rod for hoaxers and pranksters. And there were more and more like anonymous like tips that were coming in. Like somebody would tell somebody to tell someone that knew Paul Freeman or Wes or one of those guys that, hey, we found tracks at this spot or whatever. 
And then my dad and Wes and those guys, they would go out there to look at them and cast them or whatnot. And then we would find out, well, these, <clears throat> these aren't real. And so people were trying to play pranks on him and jokes for, to get their name in the newspaper or whatnot, you know, whatever. Yeah, but sure. uh, by the end of, well, not even the end, by the first quarter of 1995, uh, my dad quit casting tracks altogether, completely. Um, and had made a comment to Jeff Meldrum that he didn't even cast tracks anymore unless they were quote unquote, what he thought were perfect. Um, and that's due to the fact that there, there was so much of this, of this going on, which greatly detracted him from having any type of obsession or excitement about moving forward in Bigfoot. I think it's one of the things that kind of killed his research and it happened a greatly, you know, after the footage, of course, you know, it deducted and he got to be on the national stage with national news. Um, over the next couple of years, we, we saw a lot of these, these things happening. And, you know, back in those days, your phone number, you know, was in the phone book, Paul Freeman, you know, and it would even go as far as you'd get a phone call from like a payphone, and somebody would say, Hey, we found tracks on, you know, dry Creek, better go check them out, you know? And then I'm sure they sit back and laugh as him and, and Wes and, and Bill Lowry or somebody drive out there and make casts of them. You know, and, and uh, yeah, it's 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 one of those things. But, you know, that kind of detracted him from it. Also, the other thing um, is that his health was greatly starting to decline by the time that he got the footage, even though he wasn't admitting it to anybody at the time. Um, and within three or four years, his health would, would be really, really bad. And yeah. he, was, he wasn't able to to go out as much. So. You know, I, I wouldn't say that it set off an obsession. I, I think that one thing that the footage did is, that, yeah, I, I think that he had that moment of like, finally, someone's going to believe me. You know, yeah. I don't have to kill one. Here it is. How could you deny this? Um, and of course, you know, it's Bigfoot, right? So when you get into any cryptid or, or paranormal or unexplained, you're always going to have the naysayers and, and you could bring a Bigfoot body in. I could put it in front of the, you could, he, I could sit one next to me right here that was moving and breathing. Um, and, you know, somebody would say it's not real. You it's know, CGI. It's fake. CGI. You know, of course, if I had one sitting next to me, it might tear my arm off, you know, on camera. Right. Yeah. But somebody yeah. would say it's not real. And you always have those detractors and there's yeah. always people that you can, you know, you could beat up on and then, you combine that with the hoaxers and the pranksters and, you know, his health declining. And, you know, by 1997, you know, he, he hung it up. That was, yeah, that was the last year, the last great thing he ever did. And it's a great thing. Don't get me wrong. But the, the last great thing my dad ever did with Bigfoot is to take Jeff Meldrum to the tracks at five points in 1996. When, when Jeff and his brother, Mike, uh, showed up at, at our house to surprise my dad out of the blue, you know, um, never having met him before and, and asked to see his his plaster casts. And, you know, after a little bit, apparently, as the story goes, according to, you know, Dr. Meldrum, my dad looked at him and said, wow, you're a serious guy. You know, you, you know what you're talking about. Would you like to see some tracks that are fairly fresh? And, you know, Dr. Meldrum said, sure, what have I got to lose? And thinking because he had heard some of the other stuff, other people had heard that maybe this was probably a hoax, you know, and uh, my dad had admitted to him. Yeah, I didn't even cast these. I don't I don't even cast anymore because of, you know, these certain things. And of course, what we get are the five point tracks that Dr. Meldrum cast, which is a fantastic trackway. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, it, it rained on the tracks that day. Um, but as I have heard from Dr. Meldrum, when they first got there, he could visibly observe dermal ridges in the tracks um, as it was raining and then could like literally <clears throat> see them appearing in front of his eyes, you know, be before they were able to cast. But um, he will tell you himself that that event changed the career path of Dr. Jeff Meldrum um, yeah. and really made him uh, a believer. So my, my, my father had an integral, you know, uh, part in, in what we see now is, yeah. you know, the foremost expert on Bigfoot, at least in North America. You know, absolutely. Well, I think one of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, things that Jeff was so impressed was, was the different toe position. Yes. Toes yeah. were all different. You could tell where the creature had gripped the mud and, 
and tried to climb and slipped in the mud and right right so you we get the toe splay and then we also get what's called the dorsiflexion which is where the toes flex upwards yes. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, something that, that you see in, in the foot of the Sasquatch, you know, and then the mid tarsal break as well. Um, and so these tracks have, you know, signs of all these things. It's obviously a moving heavy right. animal um, that has real time, you know, articulating, you know, toes and joints. And uh, I know that, um, you know, Jeff is, is one of those and, and Cliff as well, because I've talked to them and, you know, they truly believe that the, the, foot of a Sasquatch is probably it's about as flexible as our hand is. Yeah. Um, and so it, it explains a lot of these different toe positions and foot positions uh, that you see in, in, in a lot of these trackways. Um, but yeah, he was like really impressed with that. Super impressed with that. Um, and it's a fantastic trackway. And, and my, my father's thinking at the time of, I'm not going to cast this because they're not quote unquote <laughs> perfect tracks. Right. Um, well, he was wrong, you know, in, in that aspect, because, you know, they, they weren't, the cookie cutter, you know, tracks that, that you're looking at that just, Oh, they just look like perfect feet. And I think that maybe that's what my dad was looking for, you know, at that point in time. But, um, we know that, uh, you know, from Krantz and Meldrum and other people and from studying them, that those are not the tracks we want. We want the tracks that show a Dynamics, lot of yeah. with articulating body yeah. parts, you yeah. know, that's actually moving and, you know, in motion. And this is not a set of wood stompers. You know, that's stomping around and everything looks exactly the same. So. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff was so impressed with those tracks. Michael, yeah. when, when, you know, when your dad, um, when the footage was aired and he started getting hit with all these pranksters, was it, was it pretty obvious, pretty immediate? Like when he'd go out to these tracks that this is, this is a joke, like, you know what I mean? What, what they would fake, um, you know, obviously, because he had all that that history tracking them in the woods. Sometimes, yeah. You know, well, the, and the nice thing is, and and you know, leading into that, one of the criticisms my dad does get um, is because there are, and I will, see, I'm going to admit this, there are fakes in the Blue Mountain evidence. We have fake tracks that are that are in the Blue Mountain evidence, and I think um, my dad himself has casted and has credit for. I think there's three that we know we think are obvious, obvious fake casts okay and, and there's some more in the blue mountain evidence and so people point to that and they say oh look you know there's there's fakes here but um my dad was doing what any good researcher would do and so was wes and bill lowry and dave bean all those guys with him they would hear reports of tracks they would go to them and they would cast them and then they would bring those home and we have those to study and they weren't making judgment calls really on the spot of whether they were real or you know, they were fake. Um, and some of them my dad thought were real. We now know probably most likely are not or fake. Um, some of them, of course, are so abhorrently like terrible when you just look at them that, you know, like, oh, gosh, OK, you know, what is this? Right. Um, and so they're they're not even casted, you know, at all. But um, there are definitely some fakes in the Blue Mountain evidence. Um, and there's some that were casted uh and uh, you know we're good enough to pass uh there's also uh some that are not and um i'm pretty positive if not the very last set of tracks my dad cast if it's not the very last one it's close to the last set it was done in 1995 at dry creek and they are obvious fakes uh i can tell you that by looking at them i don't have the cast but i, I have pictures of them <laughs> Um, they don't look like anything else that's ever been cast in the Blue Mountain area. Um, they don't look like any of the Sasquatch feet. Uh, it's obviously somebody did a really bad job of trying to play a trick or a hoax, and, and they were cast, and we do have them in the collection. Um, and, and I actually think that's the last set of tracks my dad ever even casted. I think after that, he was just kind of, you know, he was just fed so, up. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, but to answer your question, it's, it, it's not always obvious, you, At you know. First at first right until it's just like oh god you know you know what are these and if i held a picture up of these dry creek tracks like you it's yeah so the first awful. thing was to collect the collect the evidence and then collect the, yeah collect the evidence and, and, then and that's what they it. were doing and so you know yeah he's got fakes in his his footprint evidence so what it doesn't mean that he did it okay yeah absolutely uh, west summerland has fakes and and bill lowry and dave bean all those guys um they were casting the same stuff 
Cliff Berrickman has fakes in his uh, footprint cast, and he'll admit it. Uh, and he'll also tell you that he's learned more from the fakes than he has from the real ones because he's learned to tell, you know, uh, when they are fake. Like, it happens. And if you're a good researcher and you're going out there and you're collecting all the evidence, which is what you're supposed to be doing, uh, there's a possibility that it may not all be legit. And I am certainly on board with saying that, like, 90% maybe of all the Bigfoot evidence that's ever been found is probably not real. You know, like not every picture that someone takes has a Bigfoot in it and not every footprint that someone finds is a legitimate track. Like it's, it's just the way that it is. But to not consider it is also a mistake from a scientific you know, perspective. Like you have to consider all the evidence and then you make a ruling of it. Yeah. And would, Did, you, and would you say that, Michael, because of just how long it took for your dad to collect the research that he did do? So, you know, obviously I could go out and fake a bunch of crappy footprints, but to collect the authentic article, I mean, the amount of time that would have to be spent to find this evidence. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a lot of time to find the evidence. Um, God, it would take so long to hoax some of this stuff too. I mean, uh, like the, the 1991 Mill Creek road tracks, uh, for example, that ran through wet and muddy wheat fields, multiple ones. Uh, Greg who was a survival wilderness instructor at Washington University and a tracker. He tracked the estimation was between six to eight miles. Unbroken tracks were still quick in the trackway. No signs of human habits. Six to eight miles. Okay. Um, I can't even imagine the logistics of trying to hoax something like that, uh, let alone not leaving any sign of yourself doing it or, or not being seen. I mean, something like that is just, you know, insane. So, you know, we have we have instances, you know, like that as well. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, gosh, I, I, I don't know. I don't I don't get the, the point of, of hoaxing evidence in the first place. And what drives people to want to do that? So I, I, I don't understand it. I was I was gonna say so. Obviously, when the you said the footage was broadcast, um, you know, on TV at some point after your dad had filmed it, and along with that, did the story get out of where he caught the footage? Like, so it was very like if someone wanted to mess with him, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. You know, and that yeah, must have been super frustrating well, that they could literally know, go to that area. Walla Walla at the time, not a real big town. Okay. My dad was a, quite a celebrity, whether it be famous or infamous, however you want to put it there. He was always in the newspaper. Every time there was a track find or a sighting, it was in the newspaper. Yeah. Or Vance Orchard would put it in the Waitsburg Times because he was writing for them, you know, um, or it would go in his book. And so, you know, if someone you know, wants to pull a prank and they want to get in the newspaper or whatever, they, they go make some tracks and then, Oh, Paul Freeman found these tracks and they can sit back and say, ha ha, those are fake. I'm smarter than that guy. Right. Um, you know, it's just one of those deals, but yeah, I mean, he was well known in the area. It's a small area. It was easy to find these locations. You know, D-Duck Spring is not hidden. You know, mm -hmm. you can literally drive yeah. to it. Okay. I mean, it's quite a drive, but you, you can drive to it. It's, it's not like you have to hike in. And so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's easy for people to do, to do things like that, you know, and it wasn't something that was common all the time, you know, like it wasn't like every track find is, is the possibility. Oh, of course. Track. Absolutely. He, um, especially after 92, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot in 93 and uh, 94. There's actually some really good stuff that's found in 94 on Biscuit Ridge him and John Mayanzinski from, from Wyoming um, and Dar Addington uh, found some great footprints up there and a really fantastic handprint, you know? Um, and then in 1995, we have uh, the scenic loop tracks, uh, which are really nice. And John Mayanzinski came to see those as well and took a hair sample, which I believe has a really interesting uh, lab analysis on it. But, um, you know, so he was coming to see him at that time, but basically Late 94 through 95, that one particular year right there, we had kind of a lot of this going on. And, and yeah, there was there were some pranks and some phone calls and stuff like that. And, you know, a 
anonymous like reportings of oh uh, we saw a sasquatch up here you know on this place and you'd go there and there'd be like nothing there you know yeah and, and oh, john and john Lyonzinski was a, bi a field biologist yes amazing yeah. field Worked for the biologist. forest service himself in the shoshone yeah. national forest yeah um in his uh encounter in 1972 when he was working for the forest service is really similar to my dad's actually in the way that they were treated because john uh was basically told by the forest service if you don't shut up about this like you'll never work for the government again uh it is basically oh. what they told him and my dad was kind of told the same thing where he was demoted to a desk job and he was not allowed to talk about this anymore you know and which is kind of one of the things that led to him you know quitting his job at the forest service there's a nasty rumor out there that he was fired it's not true i just talked about this with cliff and bobo uh he quit his job at the forest service yeah so, yeah did did your dad ever um have rocks thrown at him did he ever hear screams yeah um, uh, wood um he you know as the story goes and we don't have it on camera uh because the camera was shut off at d-duck spring but if you listen to any news interviews or read anything that happened right after that he will tell you that uh however many sasquatch that were there that day that did not want him there got a little aggressive in their vocalization uh may have even tossed a few rocks at him uh enough to to scare him to where he admits that he you know kind of hit out for a little while and broke out into a, a cold sweat uh you know before he got the courage up to you know get back out of there and you know turn the camera on again to, you know but um there's a few other instances where we have some some vocalizations that are recorded um that you can't really hear you know or it's it's just not anything um i think i have one that i listen to and you, you can't even hear yeah what, what's going on with it but he's commenting on how he can hear it but you can't hear it on on the recorder so it's it's not something that's been included in the book because there's nothing there you know to hear but uh i do have kind of his description on what some of them do sound like and and i he believed that uh, they could mimic as well and a lot of times they were possibly mimicking the bull elk uh you know calls that that were being made um interesting with my dad and his 15 you know years of research uh zero reports of tree knocks ever none not a single tree knock ever reported uh not a single structure uh found or ever reported um of them them building you know any structures uh I do know at one point in time he found uh, some type of rock formation on a ridge, uh, but I, uh, he believes that it was probably Native American and very old. Yeah. So um, let's just we're, we're, for the last thing, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the show. Do you feel that maybe along with Patty, these sightings that get filmed where they're out in the open, you know, they're not they're not obscured by brush. And they expose themselves. Do you think they're doing that on purpose, possibly to lead the you know the men away, like Bob and Roger? Because it's clear Patty was probably postpartum uh, because of her breasts right. were engorged. Um, do you think that maybe this was a similar situation? Yeah, I, no, I do one hundred percent. I absolutely okay. believe in both those circumstances that they choose to show themselves on purpose there's a reason that they do it um and i hear people in in my dad's video all the time they say well why did it walk that way across the right. camera in front of him why didn't it just go into the woods and he would have never seen it you know first of all one thing i would like to say is a pet peeve of mine is it highly perturbs me when people try to assume to know what a sasquatch's behavior would be when we don't even know what they really are so quit yeah. assuming to know what they're going to do in every situation. <laughs> exactly. Number one, okay. <laughs> when people do that, what they're actually saying is that's the way I would have went. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Number two, uh, yeah, I believe at least in my dad's footage, and I'm a, I know far much more about my dad's footage. I'm more of an expert on it. That it chose to show itself to him. Um, to kind of distract him from the fact that there is an infant there. 
and when it's the kill deer, head, just like the kill deer with the broken wing. Right. And just like, you know, when it snaps its head at him, that that is a warning that says, do not come any closer. That's it. And I also think that it, it goes out of camera and it hides itself and he can't find it yeah. because it's not taking a direct line to the location of that baby so he can follow it. I think yeah. it's taking an off course line to the location of that baby that he can't follow and he doesn't see it until it pops out, you know, uh, to grab it. But um, yeah, I, I think that it's a situation where it was hiding from him and he continued up the trail and he's filming the tracks and he got just close enough where she finally said, okay, enough is enough. And she comes out in front of him and it's that slow methodical yeah. lumbering walk of, you know, and she's massive through the chest and everything. And she turns and she glares at him and she hides in the tree and she looks at him again to see what he's going to do, you know? And then I think that she takes an off direct path uh, to, to go back and get that infant. So he can't, you know, follow where they're going. Cause he's obviously a threat. And my dad himself has said that he doesn't think they have any intention of hurting anyone, you know, uh, but it doesn't mean they wouldn't. Yeah. You know, and, and I certainly don't think there are magical fairy creatures that are nice to everybody. Um, and will guide you to the land of milk and honey. That, that just, that's not my thought, you know, on them whatsoever. I think that they are, uh, a hominin and a wild animal. And, um, you know, from what we know about gorillas and other great apes, probably at least 20 times stronger, uh, than a full grown man, um, of the human species. And yeah, severely, uh, compromise your health i'll say um, <laughs> and so yeah. you know well one of, one of the things that's um most interesting about your dad's footage is the step frequency it's obviously coming from a very large heavy bulky animal right um you can always tell the size of a creature by how slow it steps you know, how big and how slow, um, you know, little tiny creatures right. you know, ding, 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 yeah, ding, and, and they're gone. You know, that's another thing with Patty as well, right? Is uh, one of the other things I hear is, well, you know, aside from people uh, presuming to know what a Bigfoot would do is everyone seems to assume that every Sasquatch that you ever see should look and walk just like Patty. Yeah. Because she's like the accepted big famous video, but just like humans or even chimpanzees can have multiple variations in the way their faces or bodies or hair look. Um, you can only assume that Sasquatch are probably going to have some differences in their physicality. Yeah. Um, and Patty, when she walks, she's walking down that nice sandy flat Creek bed. Uh, the subject in my dad's footage is not in the same situation. Um, and you can tell that uh, really when she steps in front of that Douglas fir, what we refer to as the Christmas tree, the tree she brushes against, there's a hole there. And she drops down, I would estimate, about a foot in elevation. Mm. Boom, one step. So she's stepping into a hole. Uh, there's deadfalls there all over the place. Um, it's rugged terrain. It's not easily accessible once you get off the trail there at Deduct. And it's completely different terrain than Patty's walking in. And so, yeah, she doesn't have that, like, really fast kind of flowing glide right. that Patty has. It's more of a lumbering, you know. But, again, I think she's bigger. Number one. Well, here's uh, what. Well, look, we'll just hang on a second, Michael. Older, and number two, the terrain is completely, completely different. Yeah. Plus, like I said, <clears throat> stop assuming what they would do, and also stop assuming right. that every Sasquatch. But, will but Michael, 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 Michael. Right. If I take an uneducated or just an anthropologist doesn't know anything about Bigfoot, and I show him Patty's foot, you know, Patty, the footage right. of Patty, and in your and the Freeman footage. They will pick the Freeman footage every time as being authentic because of the step frequency. Yeah. And I, it's I don't what, know it's, that, I'm not so saying, I, you know, look, I'm not, no, 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 uh, no. I'm not saying that, that they're right. I'm just telling you what they do. Right. I'm not saying they're correct. I'm just telling you what they, they do. They just gravitate towards the Freeman footage and they'll say, that's the real creature because of the step frequency. Yes. Right? I'm just telling you what they and, tell me. You know, uh, I think my estimation personally on her, and, and again, I could be wrong, but I, I think that the one in my dad's foot is just probably 600 pounds. That's, that's about yeah. my estimation at this point. Yeah. Um, I and, wouldn't disagree. 
maybe not as tall as you think that she would be. You know, again, with Bigfoot, everyone thinks they're seven to eight feet tall. That's every yeah. like report that you get. This one's probably more like six foot six, maybe six foot seven. Um, but it's consistent because, you know, um, Grover Krantz was telling everyone that Patty was six foot six when they thought she was seven and a half, eight feet tall. And yeah. we now think that we know due to measurements and new technology that she's probably about six foot six. No, it's not true. 14, I don't think that's true either. She has I think it's totally wrong, print, but whatever. You know? What do you, what do she's, you think she's bulky she's at least seven two you think so yeah 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 absolutely i i, I, go I off, know. i'm measuring other things that they're they're not measuring they're they're not taking many things into account they're looking um, at they're looking too much at lens sizes and things so like that. with with the fact that she has a 14 inch footprint you think she's that tall yeah seven two and you yeah. think the ones that have like 18 19 inch footprint how how tall do you think what do you, what do you look oh, at? Oh, I think there? they're a little over eight foot, just a little bit. So not much and that much foot difference? Yeah, no. Huh? Okay. No, because, you know, there's, but, there's you know, I just go off human. Weird. I go off humans and, you know, there, there's plenty of humans with um, short people with big feet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I agree with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I think but, we're more on the human scale. So but the one, but there's, um, you know, the, the well, one in, in my dad's footage is only a 13, 13 and a half inch foot right. um, which isn't much smaller than Patty. Um, yep. So, I mean, if there's general consistency, you would think they would somewhat be the same size. But as I did talk about earlier, you know, making the point that there has to be inconsistency as well, just like with every other species. Oh, you're going to have tall and short. You're going to have fat and skinny. Um, you know, well, they, let me put it. Let me put it this way: There's plenty of six foot five people with shoe size of eight and a half. There's also plenty of six foot six foot five people with you know size 13, 14, right, right. 15. Yeah. I mean, I I see your point there because there has to be some type of 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 variance. You know, yeah, um, there is. I personally don't believe the one in my dad's footage is super tall. No, um, I, I don't either. But, but I do think that she's extremely, extremely heavy. Yeah. yeah. There's another thing that nobody really knows about in the footage, and I'll mention it here. <clears throat> There's a point where she's looking straight forward, walking. There's a pine bow that snaps back. She catches that pine bow behind her. Behind her, yeah. Without looking to stop it from making noise. Yeah, how how long would you have to practice to do that? I, I exactly. mean, exactly that that is uh, animal instinct, yeah. you know, and something that's natural to to avoid making noise. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yep. Um. Yeah, that that's actually pretty amazing in, in the footage as well. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of people don't know that they don't, I guess, no. uh, pay attention to that part. They think that she just kind of plows like through the side of of that tree. Um, but it, it's a little more graceful than, Oh, when I, when I saw that, I went, Whoa, I went out and tried to practice. I mean, there's just no way. Right. She does it. She just does it. It's so instinctively. It's just like kind of this snap of the wrist, grabs it, stops it. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing, but yeah, I, I've heard so much stuff lately. I just heard two days ago, um, on something, uh, a podcast, somebody did somebody saying how bad the suit was in the Freeman footage. Like literally, that's like one of the things they brought up. Well, so is, uh, so is Patty. Patty's horrible. Even Look, though you can see every tendon and muscle. Every Bigfoot looks like a guy in a suit yeah. because we don't know what Bigfoot looks like, right? We yeah. we don't have a live one for everyone to look at and say that's actually a real species. So every time somebody sees one, the first thing that comes to mind it's a guy in a suit. A oh yeah, but if you took a guy in a suit and had him rock, you know, walk that same walk. That would look like a guy in a suit. I would look exactly. That would look like a guy in a suit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. People yeah, don't realize I, I, how fake a guy in a suit really, really looks. Is, like yeah. you can go to Spirit Halloween, you can get a crappy costume and you film him walking across the tree and line and it's baby, gonna look ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's look ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah, I, I yeah. would challenge anyone to go put a suit on and fake feet stompers to leave footprints because we have footprints at the footage, right? And a mask and everything, and try to get as bulky as the one in the video, I don't even know how you would do that stuff, your suit or something. And to walk the same route uh, that the subject in my dad's footage walks without falling down. 
Um, and then to try to go down that 15 foot ravine, you know, um, you know, Oh, and then, and then do a, um, then do a supersonic head snap. That's (laughs) probably, that probably heated the air up. It was so quick. Right. Right. (laughs) And what is the explanation now for the baby? What's it going to be my crafted a marionette doll? It's a marionette. It's it's gotta be a marionette. Yeah. Yeah, Gotta be, gotta be right. It was a puppet master up in the pine tree. There you go. <laughs> and your dad slept on it. Dip, dip, but but nobody knew about it. But but nobody <laughs> yeah, knew about right. it for He's years. for ten years. Exactly <laughs> right. I know. I know. Yeah. The, the, the more people like uh, try to be skeptical and try to pick apart the footage, the the more they prove that it's it's real and it's legit because they, yeah. they start pointing out things and you start taking a look at them. And you're like, well, it can't be. You know. Look, look. When I get a piece of footage, Michael. I immediately try to debunk it every which way I can. I do everything. That is my goal, to debunk right. the footage. You and I to. trust me, I tried yeah. on your dad's. You, you have to. You have to eliminate the possibility yeah. of, of something being, you know, uh, fake before you can accept that, it, that it's real. Yeah. I, I mean, that's a good researcher and at any level is going to do that. Yeah. Well, I think with that, let's... Um, Let's um, say good night. Thank you so All much, right. Michael. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's nice to talk to you guys. Uh, yeah, and totally. hopefully soon. Uh, it will be. Yeah, we will we'll be shipping. A, a book that will be shipping. And anyone watching, if you haven't pre-ordered it yet, get out there and do it. You'll save 20%. It's cheaper now. Yeah. Alex, do you have a do you have a rough ship date? A rough ship date? Just. Let's no. say, let's say two weeks. Okay, well, that's pretty well. That would be um, no uh, first week in November, approximately. Yeah, yeah, yeah around yeah. first week in November, the books will start. We'll see, we'll see how bad Michael beats me up when I send him the new copy. <laughs> well, you never know. Now, I I, I do want to get it out. Um, you know, yeah. and I know people are waiting for it, but we, um, it in all be honesty, nice. I would rather have a good book that's done Absolutely. well. Absolutely, that is delayed rather than have something that's rushed and has mistakes in it. And hopefully everyone appreciates that. I like to tell people that, you know, the normal average book, and Alex, you can disagree with me, takes between one to two years to get published. Yeah, it's a long lead time. And this book is far more complex than that. And we've been working on it how long, Michael? Five months total? Yeah. Yeah, Something like that. but that's from zero. That's from zero. It's gone yeah, fast. There was no, fast. there was no book five months ago. You no, know, it's it's gone fast. Yeah, so, so we'll, uh, you know, be, we'll beginning of uh, beginning of summer is when we started, right? Yeah, you know, uh, loading stuff into the drives and stuff like that. So, I mean, as as the scope of books go, yeah, it, it's gone extremely fast, and and I'm not complaining, you know. But I, yeah. I know there are people out there that have ordered it you know, and already, and they're kind of waiting for it, but uh, wait a little bit longer, let it get finished. So it's the product that I actually want to put out there yeah. and you'll be happier with the money you spent. I guarantee it. Absolutely. If somebody wants to contact you, Facebook, best way. Uh, Facebook is a good way. Yeah. Michael Freeman, uh, pretty easy to find on there. And um, Twitter, uh, M Freeman or not Twitter, sorry, Instagram. Uh, M Freeman 77. Okay. Uh, is, is my account on there? Uh, those are the, the, the two best ways to, to contact me. Yep. So, and and the I'm, book is, the book is ready for pre-order on hanger one publishing. And one is numeral one hanger one publishing. Yes. Yeah. And when it's, then when it's out, the price is going to go up and it'll be on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I mean, we everywhere. Absolutely. But the price will be higher. So get it now at yeah. uh, 20% cheaper, you know. Well, they'll definitely have it for Christmas. And what a great Christmas gift. Yeah. Well, and, you yes. know, I mean, it has it has a high price tag. It, it does. But it's going to be worth it because of what it is and, and what you get in there. I mean, it, it's it's going to be worth every cent you spend. Yeah. Um, but if you can get it cheaper, you know, that's always good. And, and hopefully, hopefully everyone enjoys it because it, I'm worried about it. I mean, honestly, yeah. you know, I, I want to be um, educational enough to appeal to the hardcore researchers. Yeah. Um, and I want to be entertaining enough to tell a story and appeal to more novice people. And, and yeah. 
hopefully find a way to meet in the middle and find a way to make everybody happy, which won't happen. I know not everyone's going to be happy. And I can tell you the names of a few people that won't be happy, <laughs> you know, but because uh, we all have our trolls and, and whatnot. Um, and I'm sure they're going to listen to this because they, they like to listen to everything I do and then turn around and troll about it. But whatever, um, I guess if I'm that important to them, they can waste their time on me. So, you know. Well, the, well I will say this book will make your father's story come alive for the reader, the audio, the video, the yeah. pictures, um, you know, it, it really tells the entire story leading up to that great moment where he caught that footage. Uh, yeah. It, it's, you know, like I said, just hopefully it's dynamic. And if nothing else, people are just like, wow, this is cool, you know, but then they also get to learn uh, some things about my dad that maybe they didn't know. I guarantee you, uh, I almost guarantee that there's not a single person out there that won't, learn something from this book even if it's just about his personal life won't learn something that they did not know uh you would you would have to be a member of family i think to know everything that, that that's going to be in there yeah so. sounds good well thank you so much michael thanks um for all you do alex and we will sign off thanks all guys. Right, thanks, for, thanks for having me on guys it was fun yep thanks all right Till next time. I call you up in the middle of the night. Been bothered by dreams, ain't feeling alright. You give me comfort, say just give it some time. By the end of our talk, I'm feeling just fine. You and I will always know where we belong. This ain't no ordinary love we got going. Should be in doubt and I pray they never can put